This is the motto of the show Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, but gold still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman Pope's rule the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome's sweet lie with 50 million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today They offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jogler 66 Hour of the Truth, the War on Disinformation, my second channel. Again today on Sunday the 6th of August, one day after yesterday, where I since long recorded another episode of History of the Inquisition. I've come today to do the same and record the next part. But before I start the recording, I want to show you um, the extra PDF that I spoke about last time that uh, some brother in Christ sent me in the description box in one of, of one of the episodes where I told, well, this is quite an abridged version, you know, where we started reading yesterday. Of course, you see this is much better to read, yeah? Um, but the point is, <clears throat> on page 93 in this PDF, this chapter 6 that we yesterday started, St. Augustine's opinion concerning the persecution of heretics, and it starts actually with more, of, more or less the same letters, but then you go to the next page, and the page after that, and <laughs> one text that I highlighted here that we spoke about yesterday, no good men in the Catholic Church are pleased that anyone, even an heretic, should be punished with death. And then you go to the next page, and uh, a few more notes that I took there. And then on the next page already, page 79, and we started on page 75, so it's four pages later, you already have chapter 7. And this is this thing that confused me, you know. I, of course, I, I would love to read this because it's so much easier to read, and when it's easier to read, it is easier for me to make my comments at the appropriate places. But now have a look at the other uh, at the other PDF. Uh, we stopped yesterday reading on uh, page 36, as you can see here, and we started on page 30. Six pages of 
this written and only four pages are written in the other format of letters. You see the difference? So I, I, I do not think that you could even call this a legitimate book. I mean, it's, it's a complete other book, I have the, uh, the imagination. And when I did word searches in this new version of things that I read in the old version, I couldn't even find it. Now, I don't know. Is, is that a glitch in the system? Is that a glitch in the matrix, how they call it or what? I, I don't know. I can only tell you that this harder to read version, where we are now at volume 2, chapter 6, now I will continue that one, even though it is much harder for me to read. But I don't want to leave out a lot of things because yesterday we read six pages and the whole chapter in the other version is only four pages. So when that brother in Christ tried to warn me, tell that my version quote unquote has missing pages, I think that he should have a close look at how many missing pages his version has. But you know, I appreciate the effort. It's, it's, it's very much appreciated that somebody wants to help me and say, yeah, listen, this is an easier version, you can read this. And You know, I even bought the book online on chapter 2 and I threw it in the garbage. And do you know why? I threw it in the garbage because it was a print of what you see here, of this old English writing, and then in a quality that you can't even read it as good as it is here in the PDF on my computer that I read it right now. So I was absolutely betrayed and threw more than 30 euros in the dustbin because of that. But okay, I tried. And I loved the Christian brother who tried to help me for that. But he should have better checked maybe because I think that his version is even much more abridged than mine. So that little introduction behind us. Let us go for the next reading of the history of the Inquisition. We are still reading here in chapter 6 called St. Augustine's Opinion Concerning the Persecution of Heretics. Yeah? And please understand that the so-called quote-unquote father of the Catholic Church, or the father of the Church, Augustine, has his flaws and faults, as we have already seen yesterday. Now, let's continue on the bottom of page 36 here. From hence we may see that Austin hath very fully taught and endeavored by many arguments to prove that heretics ought to be compelled to return to the church by external violence and the fear of punishments, though, it was, though he was not willing that they should be put to death. Now, we read that one already. Okay, Fear of punishments... Viol external violence and fear of punishments, but not putting to death. So this is actually a green card, or carte blanche, however you want to call it, it's, it's, it's carte blanche, I think, for the Inquisition. Because the Inquisition was about forcing external violence and uh, the fear of punishments on the people. Wherefore, we continue to read, he not only writes to Dulcitus, Dulcitius, the tribune in his 60th, epi 60th epistle, quote, Thou hast not received by any laws the power of the sword over them, nor do any of the imperial constitutions which, uh, which thou art entrusted with the execution of, command thee to put them to death. But in his 158th and 159th epistle to Marcellinus, and in his 160s to Apringius, he largely intercedes to prevent that death, and that their punishment might not reach so far. And in his 127th epistle to Donatus, proconsul of Africa at that time, he thus writes, quote, Since there are such terrible judges and laws, to prevent their in Incurring the punishments of the internal judgment, we would have them corrected, not destroyed. We would not that the, that, uh, the necessary discipline towards them should be neglected, nor that they should be punished according to their deserts. But such a restraint on their sin as that they 
as that there may be some to repent that they have sinned. Unquote. So that though he intercedes for them that they should not be put to death, yet the only punishment he would have heretics exempted from is death. Hence in his epistle to Chrysonius, the grammarian, in um, B3, C50, I don't know what that stands for, Books, book 3, chapter 50, I think it says, he says, quote, No good men in the Catholic Church are pleased that anyone, even an heretic, should be punished with death. Now, what we read here, right now, I'm going to highlight this, and I'm going to open again the other PDF, because we just saw that, that I prepared in, in reading that, in chapter 6, and we read that because I highlighted the sentence here on this page. No good men in the Catholic Church, uh, let me do the big, do that a little bit bigger here, so you can read along. No good men in the Catholic Church are pleased that anyone, even an heretic, should be punished with death. Okay? Hence, in his epistle to Chrysonius the Grammarian, he says this, Augustine says this. And we just read here exactly the same. Hence, in his epistle to Chrysonius the Grammarian, book 3, chapter 50, he says, quote, No good men in the Catholic Church are pleased that anyone, even a heretic, should be punished with death. This is on page 37, seven pages into the chapter. And the other one is only starting on uh, page, what is it here? Well, let me see. Uh, 77. So this is only the third page. It started on the bottom of page 75. So talking about an abridged version. Okay. So we're going to continue read this. And then, of course, we're going to analyze this little sentence that I've just highlighted here. No good men in the Catholic Church are pleased that anyone, even an heretic, should be punished with death. Now, this is quite an interesting quote. Because you can even discuss the very first three words, uh, seven words. No good men in the Catholic Church. Well, the question is, are there good men in the Catholic Church? Because the, <coughs> because the Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan. Can there be good men in the Catholic Church? Well, let us make a sure distinction that you understand me right and I hope that you get me right for the rest of the reading of this book. Yeah? Let me make this very clear to you. There are good people in the Roman Catholic Church. There are good people in every church, as apostate as they all may be. But I'm only talking about the lay people. I'm only talking about the normal church attending members of that church. No one in the hierarchy. No one in the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, no one in the hierarchy of any other church is a good person. Because today, I'm not even trying to speak about those times and the time of Augustine, but in the times today, you don't get to have an executive position in any kind of church without the knowledge what you are doing. You are willfully deceiving the people. In the time of Augustine, maybe there were even people in the hierarchy that still didn't know and that still were not aware of how the cookie crumbles. Yeah? But today, in the Roman Catholic Church and in other churches, the only good people are the normal lay members. No one in the hierarchy I would ever call good, because they absolutely know what they are busy with. They know that they are deceiving other people. They have access to the Bible. They were in seminaries, and all these seminaries are led by Jesuits, and they all deal with spiritual fornication, I just wanted to say, um, uh, you know, uh, spiritual exercises from Ignatius Loyola. And you know that that is wrong because you have the Bible that tells you that you should not do things like that. So when we go back here to that sentence that I was just reading, 
No good men in the Catholic Church are pleased that anyone, even an heretic, should be punished with death. I do not agree, especially not in, in the days like today, because not of the people of the hierarchy. I agree with the lay people who are just church attendants. Yeah? But, the author continues, as to all other methods of persecution, Austin is so far from being against them that he recommends them as a remedy proper of the extirpation of heresies. So that means that the end justifies the means when you read this completely, when you read this correctly. Yeah? All other methods of persecution are all right as long as you don't kill him. Hey, but every other form of persecution is all right. Take away everything he owns, take away his health, take away his habeas corpus, his protected body, yeah? beat him, persecute him, inquisition him, do whatever you want, as long as you don't kill him, it's all right. Well, you know, Jesus Christ did not only say that we should not kill, Jesus Christ also said, harm no man. As all other methods of persecution, what, what are other methods of persecution? But harming my fellow man. So here, this Augustine is teaching not the Bible. And therefore, you see that this so-called church father is, biblically spoken, a heretic from the point of view of the Bible. Even though he calls others heretics because he is in the heretical church himself. Hence, in his first book against Gaudentius, chapter 5, he says, quote, God forbid that this should be called persecuting men, when it is only a persecuting their vices, in order to deliver them from the power of them, just as the physician treats his distempered patient. Oh yes, in, it's only a persecuting their vices, in order to deliver them from the power of them? That's what he says. God forbid that this should be called persecuting men when it is only persecuting their vices. Every kind of persecution goes along with some kind of punishment or, as we have read already before, punishment or the fear of punishment. Yeah? And that is not Christian. This then is the so much admired clemency of Austin, that he, of Augustina, that's the same man, Austin Augustine, that he interceded with the proconsuls, that the Donatists should not be punished with death, whilst at the same time he not only approved of all other penalties except death, such as banishment, the denying them power to make wills, to inherit their patrimony, or to receive what was left of them by others, of making contracts, buying and selling, and the like. But he himself accused them to the proconsuls, that if they persisted in these opinions, they might suffer these punishments. Now, what, we have, Jesus, what have we just read? Everything that we have just read is stealing. Yeah? When I have something in my possession and I die and I want to give my family the inheritance and I cannot, and I cannot give the inheritance because I am called a heretic by this church and the church confiscates my belongings, that is theft. So what we were just talking about, everything that I just read to here, except for banishment, because this is the only one that I agree, Denying them power to make wills, so that means that I have no power to make my will known what happens to my earthly possessions after my death, to leave them to my family, to my brethren, to inherit their patrimony, so neither can I make wills to give something to somebody else, neither even can I receive an inheritance, or to receive what was left them by others 
of making contracts, buying and selling and the like. So I am completely taken out of social life when I cannot buy and sell and the like. Why? Because Austin or Augustine just seems to me that uh, says to me that I am a heretic. And we are only doing this because of the difference of belief. It's not that I did something to him. No, it's only that I believe something else than he does. I believe in the Bible and the Bible alone, and he believes in the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church. And then he says, all these other things are all right. Well, banishment is the only one that I agree with, that we Christians, we Bible-believing Christians, should do to everyone who is a quote-unquote heretic, in our view, means does not adhere to the Bible and the Bible alone, to God the Creator, to Jesus Christ. That's the only uh, punishment that we should force on people. Banishment. Get them out of our realm. You want to do that? Go somewhere else. Do not do that on our territory. We do not approve of that. That's something we can do. But all the other things, that's persecution. Who doth not see, the author continues, that under such circumstances life is sometimes worse than death? Yeah, who does not see that under such circumstances life is sometimes worse than death? When you cannot inherit, you cannot give into inheritance, you cannot inherit yourself, you cannot buy, you cannot sell, you cannot make contracts. I think then life is even worse than death, as long as we speak about, of course, this fleshly life. And that, as Arcadius and Honorius decreed with respect to the children of those condemned for treason, life would be a punishment and death a real relief. It is much more terrible to pine away in poverty, banishment and other miseries, and then perish by a lingering death than to be killed outright, though in a cruel and bloody manner. Yea, sometimes such hath been the cruelty of persecutors, that they have denied those, who have perse uh, those they have persecuted death, that they might not seem to give them the honor of martyrdom, whilst they have invented and exercised on them all manner of miseries and tortures, that by the weight and length of their punishment they might force them to a denial of their faith. There is no need to produce many proofs or examples of this nature, or to search into antiquity for instances. If I shall only produce two fresh ones, one of which now presents itself as, uh, to us in France, there we see that the miserable reformed are not punished with death, but given up to the licentious abuses of soldiers, and that they have no end of their troubles unless they abjure the reformed religion. Meaning convert. And yet all the reformed anonymously agree they never suffered a more grievous persecution. Bohemia will afford us another instance of persons forced by the like cruelty to apostasy. We read in the history of the Bohemian persecution, chapter 99, that when the vice-chamberlain of the kingdom had solicited the inhabitants of the city, Tasta, in vain to apostasy, and was complaining of their obstinacy in the Jesuits college at Prague, one Martin de Huerna, a Spaniard, was present and laughed at it and promised to accomplish the matter for 500 pieces of gold. Quote, Taking with him some bands of soldiers, he entered the city and sent them by tens and twenties to each senator and gave them liberty to plague them by every method they could invent and by this means in a little while compelled them all to apostasy. and then received his reward from the Chamberlain. The same Martin, when others had attempted in vain the Reformation, as they called it, in the city of Kutteberge, 
terrified the citizens of the same means, till at length they were so oppressed by means of the soldiery and broken by their continued persecutions, that most of them complied with their enemies and submitted their necks to the anti-Christian yoke, whilst others, leaving everything behind them, but their wives and children went into banishment. Unquote. The like sort of reformation we may read, chapter 97, made in the city of Zetaris. Chapter 103 gives an account of various punishments inflicted, by the cruelty of which many, of the forced, uh, many were forced to apostasy, though not put to death. Well, if you are forced into apostasy, but not put to death, then you are actually put to death because you, lo you lose your eternal life. Yea, there is an account on paragraph 13, quote, that some who begged rather to be put to death than compelled to apostasy were answered, Caesar did not thirst after their blood, but the salvation of their souls. The like request made by others was received with laughter. Oh, Sirrah, do you want to honor of the honor of martyrdom? Ye wretches, you are unworthy of having any occasion wherein to glory, unquote. From these examples, this clearer than day, that some persecutions, though not reaching to death, may be more cruel than death itself. And though possibly some person may pretend a sort of, gentleman, uh, of gentleness in all this, yet let him remember what Cardinal Jesuit Bellarmine justly writes, da laesis in chapter, the book 1, chapter th uh, 21, that Austin or Augustine accepts the punishment of death, not that he thought they did not deserve it, but because it became the clemency of the church and because there were as yet no imperial laws for the law quicanci se heratici was not made till a little after Austin's death, ordaining heretics to be put to death. So they waited until Augustine, who was against putting people to death, died, and then they put it into law. The law, quicanci si heretici, was not made till a little after Augustine's death, ordaining heretics to be put to death, by which he plainly insinuates that he believed that if there had been any imperial law ordaining the punishment of death to heretics, Augustine would have approved of it, for he immediately adds that it appears that Austin thought it was just to kill heretics because he shows that if the Donatists were put to death, they would be justly punished. I continues in the epistle Parmen chapter 7 and elsewhere. If anyone will compare these things with the former opinion of Austin, he may just cry out, Oh, how much is Austin changed from himself? Who, mindful of his own former error, from which he was not recovered, but by the great patience of his friends, was against using methods of cruelty, even towards the Manichaeans. But now he approves of all punishments against the Donatists, death only excepted, that they may be compelled into the Catholic Church, even against their wills, under a pretense that at last they may voluntarily remain in her communion. Now he puts into the mouth of persons their, uh, these forced studies, speeches and pretenses, by which they are taught to palliate their return into the church, which was in reality wholly owing to violence and the fear of punishment, as though it had been voluntarily, and the very means of their salvation. But let us suppose that they believe themselves obliged by virtue of a divine command to preach their doctrine, left, lest they should disobey God, and that therefore they ought to return into their own country to propagate it. What would good Saint Austin determine against in such a case? Why all his arguments tend to this, that if they should return, contrary to the imperial edict, he should not at all disapprove of capital punishment, if it was so appointed by the laws. And indeed, all who since Austin have taught that heretics are to be persecuted and even punished with death, 
have made use of no authority more than Austin's. And to show how highly they esteem his authority, Austin's, they use his arguments as the very strongest, though in themselves absurd and manifestly contrary to scripture. Contrary to scripture, to defend a doctrine so absolutely repugnant to the nature of Christianity. From him, Augustine, they have borrowed the distinction that it is unlawful for heretics to persecute the church, but the duty of the church to persecute heretics. Read this again. From Augustine, they have borrowed the distinction that it is unlawful for heretics to persecute the church, but the duty of the church to persecute heretics. Casistry and sophistry as its finest. When they turn Augustine's words around like this, and Augustine was no saint, we have just read that, when they use Augustine's words like this, then of course they have no trouble instituting the Holy Roman Inquisition and justifying it by what one of the so-called quote-unquote church fathers, Augustine in this case, said. And that's their point. They twist the words, they use casistry and sophistry so far until it finally fits their agenda. The end justifies the means, you could also say. Now we continue here on page 39. This is now become the common exception of all the murderers of heretics, with which every one armed with the secular power under a specious, uh, specious pretense persecutes and oppresses those who differ from him. This is the principal argument by which the papists defend themselves, as I just commented on. This is the principal argument by which papists defend themselves. So here they have their uh, justification for the Inquisition. When they would justify their own persecutions of heretics and condemn all others that persecute them. And which is the wonder they command as praiseworthy and heroical, what is practiced by their own church against others, even when they condemn the same things as cruel and inhumane in them, as though they were exempted from the common law of nature, of doing to others as they would be done by? Konrad Brunus complains of the heretics and schismatics that the vandals and donatists in Africa turned and executed all the laws made against heretics upon the Catholics. These, says he, the heretics also of our time initiate. In this indeed they are worse than they, because they denied those laws were ever made against themselves, whereas our modern heretics affirm they were made and ought to be executed against the Catholics, as may easily be seen from any of their writings. In the same book he complains, that the heretics spare neither age, nor sex, nor degree, nor dignity, but rage promiscuously against children and grown persons, women and men, virgins and married, old men and young. He adds in chapter 13, quote, It is cruel and most inhumane to abuse the dead. But this is peculiar to our heretics and schismatics. They conceal the bodies of bishops and presbyters, women and virgins whom they have barbarously killed, and deny them burial. The bodies of some they have taken out of the graves and cast upon the ground, others have contemptuously, contemptuously scattered into the air the ashes of those whom they have burned, and thrown the bodies of some into rivers." Unquote. If anyone considers the decretals of the popes, the instructions of the Inquisition, and the usual manner of proceeding in it, 
in which there is no distinction of persons, but all are subjected to the Inquisition without respect to age, sex or dignity, which not only forbids the burying of heretics, but annexes a punishment to those who bury them, and oftentimes commands their dead bodies to be taken up and to be either thrown upon dunghills or reduced to ashes and the ashes scattered in the air, as shall, the, uh, as shall, as shall be hereafter more largely shown. I say, if anyone considers these things, he might well think Brunus to be in jest. He might well think Brunus to be in jest. Unless, we continue on the bottom of the page, unless he was of Austin's or Augustine's opinion that the church might do against heretics what it would not be lawful for heretics to do against the church, which doctrine once allowed, everyone will decide for himself that his is the true church and hence claim a right of persecuting others and persuade himself he does not act unjustly even though he would not allow others to act so by himself thus we see that christians by this idle doctrine ah no 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 thus we see that catholics by this idle doctrine are deviated from their original simplicity and meekness, and that in the room of mutual love by which all the faithful were of one heart and one soul, they have succeeded in the Church of Christ not only discords, contentions, hatreds and enmities, but slaughters and the worst of cruel butcheries. I think it is important that we make the distinction between Christians and Catholics. These Christians here in the sentence, we can call them Catholics because they have gone apostate because they bend the word of God. They interpret the word of God in the way that they would like it and not in the way that God meant it. I mean, it all comes down to don't do to somebody else what you don't want them to do to you. As we have just read here also. But they don't adhere to that. But surely they ought to consider that they cannot without injustice do to others what they think it would be unjust in others to do to them. Yes, what I just said. But surely they ought to consider that they cannot without injustice do to others what they think it would be unjust in others to do to them and that therefore, as they would not themselves be persecuted by others, it must be unjust in them cruelly to persecute others, even though they think them heretics. For as a Salvian presbyter of Marseille, ah, for as Salvian, so we are speaking about the person here, Salvian, sorry, I pronounced that wrong, for as Salvian, who was a presbyter of Marseille in the south of France, admirably writes in his treatise of the government of God in Book 5, page 150 and 151, quote, They are heretics, but not willingly. They are heretics in our account, but not in their own. For they judge themselves to be so very good Catholics that they give us the infamous name of heretics. So what just what so that just what we think of them they think of us we know they do an injury to the only begotten son of god because they affirm him to be less than the father they think we derogate from the father's honor because we make the son equal to him the truth is with us they imagine it to be with them we truly honor God. They think that their opinion is most honorable to God. They are dissective uh, dissect in their duty, but believe that this is the chief duty of religion. They are impious, but think it to be true piety. Though therefore they err, they err with an honest mind, not from hatred, but from real affection to God, and believing that they honor and love the Lord. Though they have not true faith, 
they esteem even to this be the most perfect love of God. How they shall be punished in the day of judgment for this error in opinion, no one knows but the judge. And therefore I think God patiently bears with them, because he sees that, through, uh, that though they do not believe aright, yet that they err from a real love and piety and truth, etc. Unquote. But the minds of Christians have been perverted from this branch of equity through the prevalence of self-love, so that when they could prevail with the civil power to assist them, they have pronounced all that differed from the heret uh, differed them from from them heretics, and then exercised all kinds of cruelty against them. And this brings to the end the reading of chapter six, and we continue with the persecutions of the popes against heretics. But we're gonna do that next time. I'm 40 minutes in, and I don't want to start 20 minutes a new chapter. We're going to do this next chapter of History of the Inquisition next time. And up to this moment, thank you very much for watching and listening. And um, please, I will try to... I, I guess I have a download link to this other uh, PDF, this one here, that we were just uh, talking about in the beginning. I think I have a download link from this. Um, if I have, I, I just don't see it here right now. No, I don't have it anymore. Otherwise, I would have put that into the description box of the uh, of the video. Then you can download it for yourself and see. But I think it was quite an interesting point that I made and that you could really uh, see that this book is absolutely an abridgment of the one that we are reading because, you know, uh, it only did um, the few pages... Um, four pages in the chapter that we just read and um, we have come to page 41 uh, or 40 here and we started in uh, 33 or something uh, in the beginning so this is a much uh, bigger book that we are reading and we will continue next time in chapter 7 on page 41 in the uh, in the book the history of the inquisition by philip van limborch and um, even though I don't have time to prepare the readings, I hope that you enjoy it and you get something out of it. And surely that you understand that, quote unquote, Saint Augustine was no saint in the biblical sense. And um, that he just twisted the words and used casuistry and sophistry to make his points. And the Roman Catholic Church does that all the time. So... I uh, thank you very much for watching and uh, listening and commenting. And until next time, Jokla66 from Hour of the Truth signing off, saying God bless you and bye bye. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you. You need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.